Hello. Hello, everyone. It's really good of you to turn up tonight. Really looking forward to this, uh, for this presentation. Um, and it's going to be my great privilege to introduce our speaker, Hashi Mohammed. Um, I saw Hashi speak at a conference uh, earlier in the year. And um, I knew straight away that I wanted him to come to Newcastle and, and talk to, to you. Um, and I'm delighted that he's been willing to do so. As you, as you will know, he's, or will find out, he has a very busy life. And so, and so um, being able to come up here is just um, fantastic. There are three reasons why I wanted him to come to Newcastle. The first, as I'm sure you'll find out, he's a very good speaker. And um, I'm sure you're going to be enthralled and entertained by what he tells us tonight. Second one is the topic of Hashi's talk, social mobility. Such an important issue for, for all of us. And um, something that uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Hashi talk about. And the third reason is I really wanted Hashi to come to the university to talk to our NEST students um, who do amazing work with refugees and asylum seekers. Um, Sometimes when people volunteer, we don't know the impact that that has. And when I heard Hashi speak, I thought that is the kind of impact that people can have on other people. And um, so I just want to tell you very briefly about NEST, in case you're not familiar with it. And then I will come back to the main person, Hashi. Uh, but NEST stands for North East Solidarity and Teaching. And it's a part of our Go Volunteer programme which is run by our Students' Union. And NEST started out as a homework club for uh, refugees and asylum seekers who started to arrive from Syria in 2015. And it literally started out with a handful of students and a handful of refugees and asylum seekers in Gateshead doing conversational English and homework. And it has expanded, it's fair to say. There are now 400 students who volunteer as part of NEST. There are about 400 learners as well. Classes are delivered seven days a week and last year the NEST students volunteered 12,000 hours between them, whether that was in conversational classes, sports, social events or outreach activities. So truly phenomenal. And as part of Hashi's visit, I'm delighted that he's going to be spending time with our NEST students tomorrow, learning about what they do, but also um, most, I'm sure motivating them to carry on doing the kind of volunteering that they, that they do. So anyway, back to Hashi. Just want to introduce him. Um, I don't want to spoil his talk, but by way of introducing you to Hashi, um, you may be familiar with him as a broadcaster. And if you're looking at the BBC website last week, you'll have seen him on the homepage, his, his blog last week, uh, sorry, his podcast last week. You may have known of Hashi as a barrister, and some of his work involves coming to Newcastle. He's come especially to Newcastle for this talk today, which is very good of him indeed. And most recently, um, his work as a writer and an author and his, and his book, People Like Us, what it, makes, what it Takes to Make It in Modern Britain. <coughs> so, Hashi will be speaking today about his, his journey, his life, how he's come to, uh, how he came to the UK as a child refugee and how he is now a barrister and a broadcaster. And when I was reading Hashi's book and when I heard him speak, I was reminded of two things. First was a quote by the Sutton Trust, a talk they did, where they talked about the difference between aspiration and expectation. And what they said is that everybody aspires to be successful, but some people expect to be successful. And that depends on where you start out and the kind of chances you have. That really has stuck with me all of this time. The other thing is I'm a huge sports fan. And there's a great quote which is attributed to the golfer Gary Player. And it's the, the, the harder I work, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. And one of the things that Hashi talks about in his book, and, and I'm sure he'll talk about it today, is that um, working hard and things will be fine doesn't always work out. It takes other things. And that's what Hashi's going to talk today. So, please can I welcome, it's a great delight to welcome Hashi Mohammed, our speaker this evening. for uh, a very kind introduction, introduction there, Mark, and I just also want to say thank you um, to everyone here at Newcastle University who invited me, who pursued me for uh, a significant amount of time for me to be here. 
Um, and it's also Steph uh, who made and facilitated my visit in so many ways. So thank you very much to, to everyone involved. In um, Mark's introduction, he said that he heard me speak earlier this year. I obviously had such an impact on him that time has flown by because actually it was the beginning of last year. <laughs> <laughs> and so I hope that when I finish today, you're going to be enthralled in a similar fashion that in years to come, you're just going to think, I only just heard him speak the other day. <laughs> Um, but also thank you very much, all of you, for being here um, this evening. And, and you know, it's a, it's a Tuesday evening. You could be doing anything else that you want. And I'm really, really delighted to see all of you here. And I'll be uh, even more delighted to see all of you by the book as well. <laughs> um, what am I going to talk to you about today? Well, today, first of all, I just want to tell you a little bit about me and how I've come to where I am now and, and what that means in terms of the context of where we're living uh, in Britain and how things are for us at, at this present moment. I have a particular connection to the North East now, as, as Mark was saying, because I'm a, I'm a planning lawyer and I do a lot of work for house builders. And one of the big house builders that I do a lot of work for is Bellway Homes, who are headquartered and founded and are very much uh, a North East um, enterprise. So I very much like to come back here often. And so, you know, it's especially good that I'm here. The second thing I want to do is I also want to challenge you all this evening about this idea of social mobility. What does it actually mean? Because I think for me and my experience, I now have a platform to be able to share some of my ideas. But hopefully I will either introduce you to something that you have never thought about before, or at the very least you will walk out of here thinking slightly differently about something you've always known, but you haven't connected the dots in that respect. And then thirdly, I also will elaborate a little bit about what the ideas in my book are, are about, what, what I have found, how I have extrapolated from my story the lessons that I hope will be useful to other people. And then finally, try and bring that all together to talk about what it could mean for our future as a whole not just as an individual, but as a group, as a community, as a country. So let me begin then with a little bit about me. Well, I was born um, to Somali parents in a corner of Nairobi, Kenya, and both of my parents were never formally educated. My parents were the first of their whole generation to ever set foot outside of their own home country when they met in Kenya. And my mother, the most incredible woman, uh, gave birth to 12 children. Now, um, being the eighth child in that list, I was very glad she didn't stop after number seven. <laughs> but I wish she had after number eight. <laughs> and we can come back to that, actually, because there have been recent debates about the idea of whether or not people should be having children that they can't support and what that means for the system and all the rest of it. But that's a debate that I also grapple with in the book, but we'll come back to that. My father, uh, who again wasn't formally educated, was a long distance truck driver driving all across the East African coast. And in the early 1990s, when he and my mother had been living in Kenya by this point for 10 years, the war broke out in Somalia where they were hoping to go back and settle. After the war had broken out and they had no nation or home to settle in after only having been in Kenya and only having had uh, a, a, about four children at that point in terms of what my father and my mother had married twice, six children in her first marriage and six in her second marriage. After then, with the war breaking out in Somalia, it meant that they had to make a choice as to whether or not they go back to a war zone or stay in Kenya and try and make a life for themselves, which they decided to do the latter. Many of my siblings who I had never met, many of my cousins, my maternal and paternal grandparents, who I had never met before, all then came to Kenya to seek uh, some sort of asylum. My father was very adamant by the point where we got to about 1992, 93, that we weren't going to go anywhere and that we were going to stay uh, in Kenya and build a life for ourselves. But then 
when I was only just nine years old, he died in a car crash. So you can imagine just the kind of chaos that ensues after that, where there is a war raging. You are now essentially stateless in a new nation. And you're attempting to build a new life for yourself. And the breadwinner, the sole breadwinner, who's there to try and provide for some people, has been killed. Which then meant that I had a bunch of siblings who then sought asylum, and cousins and uncles who then sought asylum anywhere they could. And as a result, many of my siblings, my brothers and sisters, my cousins, and other relatives ended up literally across the world. I have sisters who've grown up in Canada, I have brothers who've grown up in America, cousins who grew up in Sweden and Denmark and all across the world. We, by just again a stroke of luck, ended up in Northwest London without our mother. And so you can imagine that for, a, for any child, a nine-year-old child, <coughs> who ends up in a place like Britain, where you don't speak the language, you don't understand the culture, you don't know what's going on, you've just helped to bury your father, and you're without your mother or any adult that is there to try and help you understand what it all means. And that is, you know, it's hard to explain, and I mean, still less imagine. But here's the sting in the tale. That, which I've just told you is actually in many ways remarkably unremarkable when it comes to the story of those who came to Britain, especially in, the, in that time, for a new life and a new beginning. But what's different in my story, which I then go into in detail in the book, is that how I've ended up where I've ended up. Again, not speaking a word of English, I hope I've kind of mastered that bit. <laughs> not understanding the culture, not understanding how things work, and then trying to make a life for yourself without any real adults who understand or are able to explain to you what this all means. Through sheer staggering, rather than any sort of hard work and, and, and purpose or drive, I ended up getting enough GCSEs to be able to pass on to enough A-levels to then be able to get on to study at the University of Hertfordshire School of Law to get a basic degree in law and French, during which throughout the, the four years that I was studying, including a year in France, I worked every weekend. I then got a scholarship to study for my master's at Oxford University. I then got a full scholarship to train, to train as a barrister, qualified as a barrister at the age of 26, started working, at, working as a barrister at the age of 27. And a few years later, here I am, having written this book, broadcast on various elements of, of newspapers and, and TV and radio. Now, some might say that it's smooth sailing from here onwards, I guess, but there is still plenty of time to up. <laughs> and so that is a sort of a nutshell of how that has come about. And it's a nutshell of, on kind of a, 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 a level of just giving you that, that Whistle stop tour of a, of, a, of a journey that has been, you know, 35 years now and which continues to unfold. And what I have put in that book is my desperate attempt to try and understand what's happened. How did I come to be where I am? Why have, have certain things happened for me that haven't happened for my other siblings, some of whom have ended up on the wrong side of the law? some of whom have ended up in prison, and many of whom have not uh, sought out a different future in the way that I might have sought out, not necessarily any less successful, depending on how you define the question of success. So what then do I come to understand today as to what that all means? Well, there are a couple of things. The first is to try and understand this idea in, especially in our country here, of that all you've got to do is work hard, do the right thing, and it'll all be fine. And we know that's not true. 
deep in our hearts we know that's not true, but nobody is prepared to say it. Well, I'm here to say it. And that's not because I want to undermine the concept of hard work. I don't want to undermine the idea that you can roll out of bed, fall down the stairs, and then press so you're a professional. We know that's also not true. But what I argue in the book is that in order for you to really genuinely push yourself, the idea of working hard is what gets you to that starting lineup. It gets you to the starting lineup to figure out who is then going to do well in that race, and then we're going to really see who has worked hardest and who has had a lot of luck along the way. So that is another idea that I argue in the book that we need to redefine because of many reasons, one of which is in this country, like many other Western countries, your starting circumstances, the people to whom you are born, the particular neighborhood to which you grow up, the kind of mental and physical health that you have, can determine so much of your future before you've even reached the age of five. And so how you, do you mean to tell me that just simply working hard and pushing yourself is the only answer? It's not true. We need to find a different way of explaining to our children what it means to push yourself, because working hard is a mere basic prerequisite to be able to get on in, the life, in this life. There is so much, much more that is needed. The second is about this idea that it's a zero-sums game. That for, for some people to win, other people have to lose. I talk about in the book parents who I interviewed as to why, for example, they, ch they, they send their children to private school. What do they think they're getting out of a private school education for which they will fork out such significant amount of money? What is it that they're actually paying for? And I remember strongly, and I still talk about it in the talks and put it in the book, where a mother said to me, you know, Actually, it isn't enough for my child to succeed. Another mother's child has to fail. And that's the kind of dog-eat-dog -dog world of the brutal zero-sums game understanding that means that some people will rise, but not always rise on their own merits, but actually at the expense of others. It is no coincidence that people pay significant amount of money to send their kids, and by the way, not all parents who do send their kids to these schools and pay a significant amount of money can actually afford it. That's also a common misconception. A lot of them are breaking the bank, pushing themselves for the better of their children. And what exactly are they paying for? They're not paying for a better education. They're not paying for a different set of exams. They're not paying for teachers who teach a different curriculum, who know something that other teachers in state schools know. What they're paying for is for their children to not only be taught and taught well, but for a significant amount of time to be spent on each and every single one of those children, to squeeze out every last drop of talent that they may have, to polish them, but above all, they pay so that their children can mix with people like them. And again, that, you know, it, it's a fundamental reality, but we're afraid of discussing it. We're afraid of confronting that. And the obsession of abolishing private schools is just nonsense because it's just a waste of time. These people have made a strategic decision for which they are prepared to pay a significant amount of money. The rest of us, the rest of us plebs, of the 90-some percent who don't send our kids to private school, need to then figure out how do we make the current system work for us? And again, that's another example of how we can <laughs> tackle this question in a way that isn't uh, uh, working at the moment. The other point is also, as the, the title of the talk suggested, is just this constant emphasis that education is the answer. That education 
is the only thing that we need to focus on in order for you to be socially mobile. Education, education, education. Teachers must do more. Oxbridge University must let in more poor kids. And on and on and on. But let me tell you one small story about that. You have two individuals. Who, one of whom goes to a public school and pays a significant, his parents pays a significant amount of money to him to be there. Another goes to a box standard state school. They both end up at a place like Oxford University or Cambridge. Both get the same degree. Both end in the same job at entry level. Recent studies have shown that in five years' time, the chap who went to a public school will be earning 16% more within five years. Now just think about that. You mean to tell me that when all things were equal, i.e. they both ended up at the same university, with the same degree, in the same entry level job, how do you explain this gap in their income five years on? There are plenty of explanations for that, and I try and tackle with them in the book, and you'll see what they mean. But fundamentally, what it suggests is that, first of all, this idea that education, and especially tertiary education, I'm saying this in a university, is going to be this idea of a great leveler, it's just not true. And secondly, it also suggests that the investment that that parent put into that kid at school seems to stay with them right to when they get to that job. What is it that's happening? How do we explain that? Education is critical to anybody's human progress. <clears throat> you need to be able to write and read and think properly. You need to be able to be literate so that you can read a bank statement, understand a council tax form, and be able to actually budget properly read for fun and joy, but also be able to be confident enough to think for yourself, to question, to analyze, to use logic and reasoning. Education is the foundation of what it makes us humans. But this idea that degree after degree and debt after debt is the sole panacea to you becoming socially mobile I'm afraid to say at university here is bogus. <coughs> it's bogus. And again, these are the hard truths <coughs> that when politicians stand there and point fingers at universities or point fingers at schools as not doing enough on social mobility, they are picking on people who are defenseless and can't answer for themselves because the issue is much, much deeper. We then get to other issues that I talk about in the book that I'll touch upon very briefly. I talk about just understanding your context. This idea that one of the things for me that has been a fundamental transformation was just sitting down and understanding, here I am. I'm the first person in my whole family's lineage to be born outside of Somalia, born in Kenya, and I'm a first generation immigrant to this country. It's not the whole, you know, soft story of my dad came here with, with 50p in his pocket, which is often always untrue, because they probably had a lot more than 50p. I came here on my own with a, as a nine-year-old boy. So I, I am that first generation story, not just my dad came here and he worked hard and I was able to go to university. No, no, no. I've done all of that in one go. And so what I'm talking to you about here isn't a question of sort of hypothetical or theorizing. This has been my lived experience in my own lifetime. And one of the things I always keep coming back to is that we're not an island. The British state assisted us massively. We grew up on state benefits. Now I'm paying a significant amount of tax, for which I'm very grateful to pay. But we had a lot of assistance. 
We might have had poor schools and underperforming uh, circumstances that we were growing up in, but we never starved. We never died of hunger. We never actually had the kind of difficulties that we may have had had we stayed where we were starting out. And another element that I keep coming back to in the book that, that Mark referred to here briefly is this idea of luck. One of the things that grates me so much, and I talk about it in the book, is this idea that somehow you're this amazing self-made millionaire, that, that everything just happened because you were just there and you worked hard and blah, blah, blah. And again, it's just those narratives that sell these stupid stories. Classic example, the most richest man in the world that we know of who isn't hiding his money offshore that we can actually count his money is, <laughs> is Jeff Bezos, right? The founder of Amazon. And he talks about this great story about how he founded Amazon in this, in this garage. And there's that amazing picture of him sitting in his boxer shorts in this garage. What the, the, the footnotes and the, and the kind of small print doesn't tell you is that his parents gave him $250,000 in 1991 to play with. When Donald Trump talks about how much of he's a self-made millionaire, he gave an interview where he said, my father gave me a small, small loan of a million dollars in the 1970s. It turns out that everything that Donald Trump has ever done has been looked at, and his money that he's lost so much could have done more by just simply sitting on a stocks and shares and nobody touching it. <laughs> and the same goes for people like Bill Gates and, and others. Each and every single person who you see today who's dug incredibly well and that meteoric rise, if you dig a little bit deeper and beyond the kind of uh, surface, you'll discover an extraordinary amount of luck. Okay? An extraordinary amount of luck or privilege that they were born into. Luck is hard to explain to people and hard to measure. I'll give you one image uh, which I hope will stick with you. Robert Frank, a professor at Cornell University, who writes uh, so persuasively about various uh, aspects, but one of which is about luck, he, he describes it as this. When you're riding the bicycle and the wind is pushing you back, is in front of you, and you're cycling and you're pushing, you're fully aware of that force that is resisting your progress. That's an example of bad luck because it's there. You can measure it. You can feel it. But the moment you take a turn, left or right, and you're on a slight incline going down, and the wind is now on your back, you'll notice it for the first five seconds. But after that, you're going to go down there and you're going to think it's all you. You're going to be like, it's all me. It's me. My legs are working. You forget that you've just joined an incline and you forget that the wind is behind you. That's an example of good luck. We always notice and we're consciously always aware of bad luck, but we hardly ever notice good luck. And I acknowledge that in my book, and I list all the good luck that I had, and all of the times that things could have gone wrong, but didn't. All the things that, you know, now look, don't get me wrong, I'm no shrinking violet who thinks that I should be modest about my achievements. I, I think I've done pretty fucking well. <laughs> but it would be so delusional to suppose that it's all you. It is incoherent and disingenuous to believe that it's all you. It's not. And that's, again, a real point that I try and make in the book that will hopefully help people to try and understand this issue in a different way. Because it doesn't help just telling people, I worked hard and I just pushed and pushed and this is where I am now. Because that's not helpful to anyone. And we've got to stop saying that. Because what it does is it sets these unrealistic expectations and you just set people up for failure in a way that is cruel, unfair, and just immoral. And that's again what I keep coming back to in trying to learn the lessons that I've learned uh, uh, along the way. 
So that's more about the individual. And again, I talk about in the book about this idea of confidence. What does it mean? How do you learn it? How do you teach it? Can you learn it? Can you unlearn it? How does it work? And so on and so forth. And that's a whole chapter on that. I also talk about mentoring. Because I, again, come back to this idea that you're not an island. You're not on your own. There's nothing shameful about asking for help. And the title of that chapter on mentoring is specifically titled Filling in the Blanks. Because the idea that you must know what to do when a situation arrives, the idea that you will find a way through all the time is one of those real points where you fall off a cliff because you're putting too much pressure on yourself. So I talk about the number of times when I didn't know what I didn't know, but I knew that I just needed to ask questions. I knew I needed to push. I knew I needed to find a way of just pushing the, the, the boundaries of what I know and how to do things better. Because mentoring can mean a lot of things, especially for a mentee and a mentor. And then next is I talk about language, which is quite controversial. I've just been invited to be on the radio for Today program tomorrow. If they don't can me, I'll be on there at 8.50 tomorrow morning. And one of the things they're asking about, and will be quite controversial seeing in this amazing Geordie uh, town, and it's about accents. And this is something I talk about in the book, you know, and I talk about how people judge you, not based on what you have to say, but rather how you say it. And that's part of the social mobility story. And if you're young, at a certain age, and you think, okay, it's clear to me that because of my Brummie accent or my Scouser accent, people don't take me seriously. Because that's what the statistics show. Guess what? 28% of people believe they, that they have been discriminated against based on their accents. And they are right. Because 80% of employers have admitted that they discriminate against people based on their accents. 80% of employers look at your qualifications and then think, I don't like the way this person talks. It's not me saying that. That's what the facts say. So then what do you do with that sort of information? Do you ignore it? Do you act on it? Do you do something about it? I'm laying it all out there. It's entirely up to you what you do with that information. Nobody's prepared to say it to you because the vast majority of people will say, well, don't change your accents. Just be who you are. Just don't change. Be authentic. Well, listen to that person who's telling you to be authentic. See how they speak. And tell them, why don't you change your accent to a Brummie accent and see how you get on. It's the reality of what we face. I'm not endorsing it. I'm not condoning it, I abhor it, I find it disgusting, but it's the reality. And if you, do, if you ignore that and you tell a child who you might be mentoring or otherwise, and you do not give them that opportunity to be informed about these things, you are setting up them up for failure and it's a dereliction of duty. I then move on to other aspects about employment and employment practices and how they work and how we might be able to change things. But then I want to touch upon, because I'm very keen on getting your questions, a couple more thoughts. The next is about the society in which we live in. Now, often nowadays, we're often talking about you know, race and racism and, and the privilege and what it works and well, let me tell you, as a, uh, as a black man called Hashi Mohammed, I've had my fair share of that. Uh, I, I'd like to think that I've experienced quite a bit of it. Uh, but one of the shocking statistics that I wanted to share with you was a, a statistic that I found when I was researching for the book. A recent British Social Studies survey found the people who were interviewed, 44%, almost half of the people surveyed, by the way, including white, black, Asian, whatever, Almost half of people surveyed, 44% of people surveyed, 
believed that some races were born less hardworking. So just think about that. Almost half of people in our society believe that some people and some races were born hard, less hardworking. So imagine the attitude you're going to have if you have that view to your neighbour. Imagine you're going to, what attitude that's going to be having an impact on if you're a teacher and you're looking at one of those kids that you think was born less hardworking. Imagine if you're a professor in a place like this and you get a paper from certain people and you already have decided in your mind to have those preconceptions of whether or not they are capable, less hardworking, or worth it. Imagine you're a, a boss and you're going through an appraisal or about to hire someone and you think, I really need somebody who's hardworking. Is this person going to be it? And you find every excuse, but deep down, you've rejected that person for another reason. Again, that's the society in which we live in, and that's the context in which we are trying to become socially mobile. And again, it's not me saying these things. I'm just laying it out there and saying these things have consequences. Some positives. The positives I, I would suggest are that I, I'm a big believer, somebody who travels around this country a great deal, that despite the situation that we find ourselves post-Brexit and all those, and I'd like to be challenged on this by many of you in this room, I do strongly believe, having lived in France as a French speaker in many European countries and having traveled across America significantly, there's nowhere I'd rather have grown up and be who I am than Britain today. And I know that that sounds quite controversial for a lot of people, but I really do believe that. I really do believe that we have the conditions in this country, even after the Brexit vote that we know was a lot uh, based on uh, anti-immigration sentiments, I still believe that this is a place that is profoundly hopeful and whose people as a whole want to see a more equal society. That's my feeling. That's my experience, and it's borne out by what I have seen for myself, and crucially, what has happened in terms of the progress we have made in this country <clears throat> since the 1960s to today. That's, I really do believe that. And we're seeing it in many ways, whether it's about how we deal with university entrance exams, how we deal with more representation on the television, how we deal with a lot of things, gives me a huge cause of optimism that I strongly believe in. There are lots of other things that are happening that I, I won't have time to go through, but you know, we're seeing, obviously, employers do lots of things to do with blind ACBs, changing the way that, that, that they recruit. We're seeing universities having the opportunity to have these difficult conversations. We're seeing all of that coming to the fore. And in many ways, we're coming to a, an environment where people can't hide anymore. Things are much more open. Things are much more out there. It makes it for difficult conversation, but it's possible. I want to end by reading um, a, a, a couple of uh, a small sentences. Can I borrow the book? I, I haven't memorized it that well. But there's a passage that, that, I, that I want to just read to you that, that you know, gives you the, um, if I can find it quick enough, that gives you the overview of the book that, as to why I think this issue is, is quite hard and the solutions that I'm offering are not necessarily easy or simple or quick. But it will take time and it will take a lot of patience. But we have to start somewhere and we have to start now. So this is in a nutshell what I think is where we are, where I've come from, and how I think things are, are going. The reality remains that for a young refugee boy who buried his father at the age of nine, arrived in Britain without his mother, was brought up in poverty and among profound deprivation, the chances that you would be writing a book like this one are minuscule. Not impossible, but highly improbable. In that context, what politicians should really be saying is this. 
The chance of you succeeding in Britain today is down to many factors. The wealth and profession of your parents, the kind of school you attended, your mental and physical health, and the quality of your early environment in terms of stability and attention. You'll need to work harder than you have ever imagined and hope that whatever talents you have, given the fast-paced development of automation, are going to still be needed <coughs> when you grow up. You'll need a lot of luck as you go. And let's hope along the way that someone explains the unwritten rules of the world you want to join. And you'll need to make it through all of that with your belief in yourself, your vision for the future still intact. And then, maybe, you'll make it. Those are my words, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm ready to take any questions that you might have um, after that. So thank you very much once again. So we've got a bit of time for questions. Oh, great, some hands already. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. And um, I hadn't realised how long ago it is I heard you speak. So <laughs> yeah, thanks for putting me right on that. So um, we're going to, should we start over, over there? When you're asking a question, please talk into the microphone so everyone can, everyone can hear. And um, get our students running around. So, oh, you're not as far uh, as I thought. Tell them. First of all, actually, that was so inspirational. Thank you so much. Um, I went to this university uh, in 99. Uh, I was the first person in my family uh, to go to university. Of course, I'm not a asylum seeker or a refugee, but I found it very, very difficult because we were in class. Yeah. So I was studying English literature, um, and I heard someone in a lecture uh, say, well, my daddy's got an island, you know, I'm going to daddy's island. I, could, I was going to Netmo for me shopping and that. Do you know what I mean? It was a huge... Anyway, I just wanted to share a really profound experience. When I left, I went to work with asylum seekers and refugees. And specifically... I can hear you, I can hear you, don't worry. I can hear you on our repeat. Um, specifically, we were unaccompanied minors. Yeah. And there wasn't very good provision for it. Around about that time, I had the Yugoslavia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the Mongolian elections. So there was, at one point, I was having to take children home to my home over the weekend. Um, and we worked specifically with people who were being tortured with the Medical Foundation, you know the Medical Foundation. Um, so I worked a lot taking people down to London. We've got a Medical Foundation in Newcastle now. Um, and there was this one guy called Michael, and he was broken. He was broken. You know what I'm saying. He was physically, mentally displaced, broken, he couldn't speak the language. Now, that was a long time ago, and he got on with his life. And then, recently I've had some um, addiction problems, I'm in recovery. When I walked into the centre, we called this guy Michael, who was there to help us? Michael. Oh, wow. Now, that was, was a profound experience for both of us. Because we can, you've got no idea, there was people were like crying, we were crying, and it, it just put everything in a nutshell to me, and I just wanted to share that with everyone. Thank you me. very much, thank you very much for sharing that, I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know where the microphones are, but there's a lady over there, and then there's a lady over here, and then there's a chap there, so I'll try and... Um, Take as many as I can. Are you okay to stand up and ask? Yeah, I can ask. I can probably make my voice carry. Yes. <laughs> How much do you attribute your success to inherited genetic dispositions, sound decision making? Um, I don't know if you, whether your parents were particularly attentive or whether you found self discipline at home. What are now known as the softer skills? Is that some part of this mix? Very good question. Very good question. I'll take a couple together. Can you get a mic to this lady over here? And then 
the chap over there, there's a guy there, just there. Um, yes? Oh, this bit? Okay. Hello there. Uh, is this working? Okay, good. Um, when I was 18, I went from Bonnie Biker in Newcastle to Ghana as VSO volunteer. And again, you know, single mother, uh, she was a barmaid. But um, Ghana changed my life. I ended up in America. I was dead broad Geordie at the time. And what I experienced in America was the opposite of prejudice, or a prejudice in my favor. They were such Anglophiles that even though I was Geordie, they didn't really tell. And so I think in professors at university, everyone assumed I was more intelligent than I actually was. And I really, and even when I go back there to visit, and maybe other people have experienced that too, you kind of have more status because you have this English accent and uh, you feel so self-aggrandized and you come back home and everybody ignores you again. But, uh, back to reality. Yeah, but, but really, uh, my, my one question was about Finland where they have um, no private schools. And I just wonder, shall we ban private schools? Uh, if I had a penny for every time I asked that question, it's amazing. Uh -huh. Trap here, so I, I'll try and get as many questions in as possible. So um, yes. Thank you, sir, uh, for giving me an opportunity to ask your questions. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm one of the asylum seekers in the Newcastle. Um, currently studying in a scholarship in Northam University. So I'm passing that route. Actually, um, probably you have been faced for a long year. Um, with agreement with your terms and conditions and pros and cons about your experience, I would say those are more than 100% true. Uh, I'm passing through that moment at the moment. Uh, my question is to you, actually, that you mentioned about zero sounds game. What would be your suggestions for the people like me who dreamed about uh, their future being an asylum seeker in this country? That's a very Thank good you. Question. So I'll start with the, um, the easy question about the private schools, <laughs> if you can call it an easy uh, question. I think the obsession that we have with abolishing private schools is completely misguided. I think we waste so much time focusing on a tiny minority of people who are increasingly paying a significant amount of money that they cannot afford to send their kids to a place where mostly Russian oligarchs and Arab families are now dominating. What we should be doing is removing all the tax breaks that they enjoy, and any teacher who works there who makes a lot of money and then gets a pension that the state underwrites, should also not be enjoying that benefit, and just leave them to it. And let's find a way in which the vast majority of the rest of us can actually improve our schools and do better for ourselves, rather than obsessing over a tiny minority of people who've cornered a market, and the more we obsess over them, we give them a status they don't deserve. Alan Bennett... <laughs> say that again. The class system is so rife over here. Yeah. Do you not think it's the class system which causes uh, it? The class system and the issues of the class system are more profound and more problematic for us than the issues to do with the schools specifically. So I completely Sorry, agree. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. right. And I completely agree with you. It's, a, it's an exorcism that this nation requires. Yeah. <laughs> uh, even in a place like Newcastle, you know. You know which part of town people are living in a richer area than, than, than not. So it, it, isn't, it doesn't take a genius to figure that out. On the question of, of, of the genetic disposition, now, I, there's a whole bit in the book about my family history, and there's a whole bit in there about what is the technical term for genetic uh, disposition being biological determinism. So this idea that some people are born with certain qualities and are able to succeed in certain ways. Now, the, the science on this, despite what you keep hearing online and all the rest of it, the science on this is actually that it's mainly 50-50. So 50% of your relative intelligence is inherited, and 50% of it, it comes out in the society that you live in. The disagreement seems to be how much one influences the other. And the way I term it in the book is, how do we find a situation where, um, how many of you guys would be familiar with the, the old Harry Enfield um, sketch, uh, Tim Nice but Dim? <laughs> Do you remember that? Yes. 
And, and, and what is it about Tim Nice the Dim, who, if he had the most privilege, would get further than a really poor kid growing up in very poor circumstances, but is actually genuinely talented? So what I argue in the book is that, is that how is it that some people are protected from their genetics, <laughs> right? Some people are protected from their genetics, whilst others, the society around them will never give that, their, their, their genetics to be genuinely uh, uh, better. So for me personally, I do argue that actually a lot of why I am where I am is down to a lot of what happened to my family. So for example, my grandfather was born in a tiny little village herding goats and camel, and then one day decided, after he got married, that he wanted, and this is the, the, the 1930s, decided, I want to get out of here, and I want to go to the big city. He went to the big city in Somalia, and decided to join the Italian colonial police. Learned Italian, became an inspector, and then when Somalia got independence, decided to start his own little business. His firstborn, my father, when his father died, decided actually Somalia is too small for me, I want to try something else, and drove, and, and the first place he could reach was next door in Kenya, and decided to start a new life for himself. Nobody in my family's history had ever thought, leave the village and go to the city. Nobody before my father thought, let's leave the country and find a new world. And nobody before me has ventured out so far from our starting point to where I am now. Now, to what extent, therefore, was all of that kind of deep restlessness to want something different, to want something better, to want something more, was in us from the start? How do I quantify that? How do I measure that? I don't know. So language is also another element in which I talk about in the book, where I think that my ability to have learned languages so quickly is very much something that was, was, was I, I definitely inherited in some respects because by all accounts, my father was somebody who had learned seven languages without ever learning how to read and write. So me today speaking four languages, having <coughs> had the benefit of being able to read and write, there must be some sort of correlation there. There must be. To what extent, I don't know. My mom never learned how to read and write. She speaks four languages. You know, so that's the, that's the conundrum that you have to be careful how much I endorse this idea that, that you're born with everything that you have, whilst at the same time it would be a folly to ignore it. On the question of the young man here, for people like you as a, as a, as a, as a refugee, what's the advice I give? I have one really important piece of advice, and this goes to the people who we're going to meet at Nest tomorrow. What is really interesting for me at the moment in writing this book is today I am a barrister and a broadcaster. <coughs> I, of course, came here as a young, unaccompanied child refugee. <coughs> to what extent is that starting point still determinative as to who I am? A small quibble, no, no offense should be taken, Mark. The literature for tomorrow's event refers to me as a Somali refugee, for example. Now, one advice I'd give you is that you being a refugee today is not the beginning and the end of who you are. And people will refer to you as that for a long time. You're not ashamed of it, but it isn't who you are. It is who you are at one point in time. Nobody refers to you as a child for the rest of your life. Nobody will refer to you as a husband when you get divorced, and so on and so forth. So what I would suggest to you is that you're going to be, you're a refugee one now, you're going to be a former refugee soon enough, and then after that you're going to be who you are and you're going to get on with your life. So keep that in mind, because if you decide or other people decide for yourself that this is the beginning and the end of your identity, you're going to struggle with everything else. That's the best advice I can give you.
Um, first of all, once again, thank you um, for such an enlightening and uplifting and inspiring talk. Um, I don't really want to put a little damper on things, but what I wanted to ask you was when you, with your sort of summary, was about how you still think that Britain is a country worth living in that offers opportunities to people. Now, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that, um, because despite my look and despite my accent, I am also from a family of immigrants, albeit from just across the Irish Sea. Um, but what I want to put to you is that your experience occurred as a child growing up in northwest London at a time when arguably we had slightly far more progressive policies in this country than we necessarily do today. So the circumstances for somebody new in similar situation to you may be different. I'd just like to pick That's up That's a very good that. point. I'll come back to that. Yeah. I'll take two more questions. There's a chap there, and uh, I need a lady. Is there a lady? A lady over there, and I'll come back to you. Unless you are going to self-identify as a lady. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you've said so far. So far? So far. <laughs> <laughs> I'll check in with you after I'm done. Okay. Uh, I've worked for, um, before I retired, I worked for 15 years as a careers advisor, full time, with uh, teenagers. 21. Some went to uh, Oxford, others were special needs and all that. And the hardest group um, and where the class barriers were for me were for poor white working class teenage males. They have no pressure groups uh, looking after them. They get most demonised, including the Labour Party uh, under Blair. Um, use them for, demonised for in terms of uh, drugs and all sorts of things. And also their parents um, often have very little education and are unable to help them with things. The class barriers, well, the austerity has made it even worse, I suggest. Uh, it's now you, you include food, housing, education, accents, yeah. and most yeah. important, contact, contacts. So uh, would you have any suggestions um, I, for yes. young men? Young yeah. That's a very good point. So the lady over there. Um, so I wanted to know, so I first of all, I just want to say thank you, and thank you for the shout out. Um, we've got some of our learners here with them as well. Um, Gaff has actually just applied to study law here, so hopefully, hopefully in 10 years, 15 years time, hopefully so it'll be him on, tomorrow as well. Yeah, yeah, hopefully yeah. it'll be him on the stage. Um, but I just wanted to ask about the recent bill on child refugees yes. and the refusal to accept them. Um, what's your opinion on that? How can we campaign against it? Like, what can you suggest? Good question. I'll take one more because those are relatively straightforward to the chap that I, I denied the opportunity. Do you want to change that? Uh, provocative question. Do you have do, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's a provocative one. I want everyone to hear. <laughs> do you have any thoughts about entering politics? Oh. <laughs> that's hardly provocative. That's a, that's a, not, uh, as a box standard question that comes up quite a lot. Um, there's a whole bit, um, there's a whole chapter in the book about what it felt like growing up in the 1990s. And I call it getting on and getting along. And I explain in that chapter that the climate of being a young unaccompanied child refugee back then is, was a lot better than what you're dealing with today. But having said that, it was a lot better, not for the reasons that you might think. It wasn't better because of resources, <laughs> because 1993, when we arrived, you're getting to the point of not only a, 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 the, the, the recession that was happening, but also the end of, a, of a, a brutal period of Margaret Thatcher. And actually, things really start picking up when Labour starts to turn on the taps in the 1997, <laughs> by which point we've kind of left the system, as it were. 
as young people. We're getting into that sort of teenage years. And so it is important not to romanticize that period as being the golden age of acceptance and openness and kindness that, that might have been. But I can definitely agree with you that it was a lot, lot easier back then. Now, today is much harder, and today is a lot more difficult, but equally, you try and be a Hashim Mohammed in France today. You try and be a Hashim Mohammed in Germany today, you're going to struggle, whatever which way you look at it. And so, I'm not starry-eyed about, you know, we don't have our problems, we do have our problems, <coughs> but it's sort of two steps forward, one step back, and we just got to keep pushing. And that leads me on to the question about the bill that, that, that is in Parliament that, that was stopping the opportunity for, uh, you know, young unaccompanied children's family being reunited. Of course, I'm completely against it. But it's linked to that question because the current climate, people don't really care about that stuff anymore. People are not paying enough attention to something like that anymore. In the current climate, a lot of people aren't going to be moved enough to start a campaign or, or do something fundamental. So I don't know what it looks like. I've met with Alf Dubbs, the House of Lords, uh, a, a person whose incredible story of coming here as, as part of the, the, uh, the kinder uh, children. And he says to you that one of the challenges that he faces is that it's a government that does not think there is going to be a political consequence to putting forward a bill like that. And at the moment, they're riding high. Why would they care about some <coughs> tiny, uh, unaccompanied uh, you know, child refugees who don't have a vote? They don't care. So that's the sad reality of where we are. In terms of the white working class, there's a whole bit in the book about that. And there are lots and lots of issues with that. But chief among them really is that they have been demonized for all the wrong reasons. But fundamentally, I think it's also, a, 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 and I don't want to sort of beat around the bush here, there is a problem of both, there's a whole chapter called imagination in the book, a problem of imagination and a problem of aspiration, in the sense that I've gone to a lot of these areas where a lot of young white working class the kids are, are at, especially in, 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 in South East London, and you meet a young boy who'll say, I just want to do what my dad does, or a young girl who just wants to do what her mum does, and there's no real imagination to think for yourself what more could I do? What more could I aspire to have? And then push towards them. That's the first thing. But secondly, the jobs that those kind of people would have done, that community would have done, are just not available anymore. If that young lad now wanted to train as a British gas engineer, who then gets trained at the age of 14, 15, 16, by the time he's 35, he's at the top of the food chain before, and then he will be part of a group of white working class people who have a real trade, a real salary to pay for their families, go up the ranks of management, and actually in a way that used to be their own little public school clique thing for them as actually trained people. All of that is gone. And the, the answer that Blair had for them was go to university. Well, they may not want to go to university, that's just not the answer. So for me, it's a difficult problem of overstepping the mark, and I, you, know, you don't have to take it from me. Angela Rayner was saying herself that a lot of the white working class community need just that push for themselves to aspire to want something different. But then the answer to that is then, well, what should they aspire to? If there are no opportunities for them, what should they be doing? Can I just give you an answer to that? Yes, you can. And I, you have to give me a short answer because I want to try and get more people in there. Uh, my take, job the mic, was take the mic, take, take the mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, one of my jobs was to give them the imagination. But you'd find uh, politicians saying, oh, if you can't get C grades, you're no good. Yes. Or whether out there. Like, uh, and many kids couldn't do that, but they could get through the barriers by getting a trade and actually working themselves up so they don't need to go to university. Yes. And that was. But all the politicians were obsessed, uh, obsessed. with C. Um, and so the families had no, um, uh, in my, well, not, 
will to go up because they knew or thought they knew that they could, kids couldn't. Yeah. But once you got them saying, well, yes, I would like to go to university or I would like to be um, an engineer, they'd work really hard and could get through. So I think you need to get the pressure off them uh, being told that they're, you're no good. I completely agree with that. Uh, there's, no, there's no disagreement there. Um, on the last, I'm going to take a couple of questions before I answer the quick one about politics. Yes, I, I have been told countless times that, that I should run for politics. I'm enjoying the life I have right now. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea of having my poor wife worry about crap that's going to be written about me walking down the street in the Daily Mail or the Sun just horrifies me. So I'm enjoying my life as it is right now, and, and, and you know, I'm, trying, I'm hoping I'm making some sort of difference in this way for now. So let's see. Yes. So the lady right at the top there, and there's a lady here. Uh, anyone on that side? Uh, there's a chap over there. We'll come back to you. So one, two, and then three. I'm very interested in the way people learn, and I'm interested. I found that uh, they need self-confidence, and it's knowing how people learn. There are two methods in which you learn, which I disbelieved when I was learning about. One is you take information in, and you and you give it out as you uh, heard it, learned it. The other way is you take information in, and you brain reorganizes it. I thought that was a little bit of rubbish, but I had to try some experiments on myself. And to my horror, I found it's true. And in fact, I learned by reorganizing the material and putting out in another way. So I thought that it was necessary to provide materials, working with people, I'm uh, thinking this Jamaican, who came to this country, and he was quite a successful criminal, but uh, was the youngest who was left at home and I don't know what the education was in like in the head office or what I thought. And he was very, very clever, completely illiterate. <clears throat> but by using materials yes. in that way and convincing him, at first you said it was rubbish, and I said just do a little bit more. He was brilliant and he came completely. Fantastic. Rubbish. That's the kind of innovative. So it's the way in which you actually communicate with people. And if you're not succeeding in one method, Try and find another way. I completely agree, and I'll tell you a story that will, will back that up. Um, could you get the mic to a guy on that row there, and I'll take this question from here. Is there a lady here? Yes. Hey, um, that's really thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. I don't, I don't think that mic is working properly. Try that again. I said I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I came to the North East about 15 years ago as a child, but with my mum. <laughs> I went to this university and um, went on an internship um, that was set up by Matt did the same course as me and he advised me when I arrived there um, you might want to adjust, adjust your accent a little bit and not sound so Geordie <laughs> which is very interesting um, but um, so my question was now that kind of you've made it and you're really successful have you ever encountered from like the black community kind of like a a bit of cutback, kind of saying, well, you're not really black, you don't really wear centers, or, and if you have, um, how do you deal with that? Very good question. Uh, uh, because we're going to finish in about five minutes, I'm going to take, um, I'm going to take these two ladies after that chat, and then that will be it, I think. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I was a bit anxious that, although you were um, right to challenge us about things that people don't say very often, such as the inequity in our schooling system, um, that you had a, a slightly um, a, a, a recommendation that we don't worry too much about that kind of thing. But actually, when you were tested on it, you think we should challenge, we should change the system, and we should make it harder for people to segregate themselves in the way that they do when they go to private schools. So, uh, so I, I, I think when you described... Uh, you, uh, it's a very good point. I mean, the, the distinction I was making was there's no point in trying to abolish them. Yeah. We wouldn't create them today because they're mad. Yeah. But abolishing them is crazy. What we should do is do everything else short of abolishing so yeah. that everybody has to come and improve their state system. Yeah. That's the answer. I, and I agree with that completely. And uh, following up from the, um, the lady here, 
here. I think it does underpin a huge amount of the class problem that we have in the UK. Um, uh, in Blackburn at the minute, they're putting it on the television, aren't they? They had this experiment after the riots to say, let's put kids from different communities yeah, into yeah. the same schools, and they call it contact theory. Um, uh, and uh, you know, and yet we have a system where the ruling class like to uh, no uh, no longer have any contact with the rest of the community. I think we should break that down uh, as quickly as we can. Um, and I'd like to um, hear more about that. Uh, I, will, I will say a bit more about that um, and, and why I agree with you in principle, but in practice why it might be a bit more difficult. I'll take these two ladies and then I think that's that. Um, yes? I was just about accent and success. Uh, do you want to repeat that? Um, <coughs> accent and success. And what about them? Do you, what my views are? Your views are whether it's linked to success. Yes. Very good question. And the lady just behind? Um, hello. It says people like us, what it takes to make it in modern Britain. And I would like to know about what made you, from nine years old, young boy, till barrister, because there sh should be some personal quality in it. What motivates you as a person? Like, you know what you, if you think, yeah. sorry. No, no, no. If you think you didn't come just by yourself, there was like, Two, three, five, ten. I don't know about. There was same children, exactly yeah. same circumstances, but they are not all barristers at the moment. And what made Why? you different what made here? You what different? What's your mindset like? There's 300 pages um, <laughs> to, to help you understand that uh, for 15 pounds. <laughs> it's more about your personality. No. What drives you as a person? Yeah, that's a good question. It's in the book, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a short um, overview of that in, in a moment. On the question about teaching styles and helping people learn differently, I think that's so important. I completely agree, and it's really important. One of the stories I tell in the book was how I was struggling to really concentrate in school with all the problems that was going on at home and all the issues that we had. And one summer, one teacher decided that a bunch of us boys who um, did not have the, 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 the capacity in terms of money and resources to ever go on a summer holiday. I never went on a summer holiday ever uh, growing up. And she took us all one summer to B&Q and she bought a bunch of paint and we spent two weeks in the school every day painting our classroom, our form class, painting the walls, we'd have pizza, We'd meditate, we'd, she was a French teacher, we'd be talking in French while we painted. We painted like the Eiffel Tower on one wall, all in just in our room. And we did this amazing decoration for two weeks over the, over the summer period. And I found that when I went back to school in that September, I concentrated more and was so proud of that room than I had ever been in my life. And it, because we were constantly moving around from one squalor council accommodation to the next, that room, became the only constant thing in my life. And I still remember it to this very day. And that's an example of you fundamentally changing somebody's opportunity to concentrate through something that isn't actually education related. Just a thought for the teachers that are in the room. You probably, for health and safety reasons, wouldn't be able to do that today. <laughs> On the question about the black community, I, I, I genuinely haven't had any backlash. It's interesting because when I talk about how People should think about changing their accents if it would help them get on, and that they shouldn't worry about this idea that they're portraying where they're from, because I think that's all nonsense. It's really interesting because it's usually white middle class people who speak with a received pronunciation push back at me saying that you're, you're telling people not to be themselves, whereas black people always turn around and go, well, I'm never myself at work anyway. This is just one other thing that I have to do to be able to adjust. Yeah. So I get a lot of support from the black community in that sense a lot. But the bit that is, is a difficult thing that a lot of people are gonna struggle with in the book is I say a lot about fatherless homes. And a lot of people are gonna struggle reading that in the book in terms of what my views are on that. On the question of ac accents and success, undoubtedly, ladies and gentlemen, it won't be as a surprise to you, your success is very much determined by various factors but accents is one of them. And the reality is that just a recent study, Google it when you get a chance, just a recent study that came out 
um, from Chicago University that linked your opportunity to actually get a pay rise and how you spoke and your accent. And that, you know, don't take it from me, the, the studies show that. And as I said earlier, 80% of employers admit to discriminating against people. I did a, a lot of interviews with HR managers who would say to me, oh, she was great. She was great on paper. She was fantastic. She passed all the metrics and everything. But she had, I could, we couldn't hire her because she had an Essex accent. She had an Essex accent. We couldn't put her in front of the clients. That's a HR manager patently admitting in front of me that that's the situation. So even the HR people who might be enlightened enough to think this is crazy, they still have to deal with their employers and their clients who might not want that. So that's a, the question about that. Um, on the question about the, 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 the private schools and whether or not we should be trying to, I agree with you that the way in which our private school system is set up is undoubtedly one of the bedrocks of propping up the class system. But you have to be careful about that for two reasons. One, the, there are so many people out there breaking their backs to get their kids into these private schools, and most of them, and I would argue most of them, aren't upper class or middle class, but are actually aspirational people who work desperately hard to cobble together, remortgage their houses, take huge amounts of debt, just to be able to get their kids there. And that is something we have to acknowledge. The second thing is also, when we start from a place of saying we want to demolish the schools because they're doing these things out and the other, what that does is that it doesn't reflect on what I consider to be what the rest of us are thinking, which is a, po a position of envy, where we're saying we can't have it, so you shouldn't have it either. What I much more prefer is that we continue the current trend where the school like Eton, which was a term in 1991, a term, it cost you 1,200 pound. 1,200 pound to go to Eton in 1991. Today for a whole year you're paying 40 grand. Do you know why? Because most of them are now Russian oligarchs and Arab families. I want to get to a place where it's become so prohibitively expensive for a well-to-do barrister <laughs> to afford a place like that so that I'm then forced to pay more attention to my local school, become a school governor, improve my local school so that when my child's 11, it's fit for purpose. That's the more strategic thing to be doing. That's the way forward, rather than starting from this position of envy. The last question, because I've got to uh, close now, I think, um, what's going on. The, the, uh, the question about what was different about me. I think... There's a lot in the book, I promise you, but just the one thing that, the two things that I would say is that I was very lucky in that when my parents met, my mum who had left her kids in, Ken in Somalia with her mother, and actually I figured this out during the writing of this book, that I'm the only one in the 12 children they had who was alone with them without any undivided attention for two full years before my next sibling came. <coughs> I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, that's not a coincidence. The first two or three years of a child's life is critical. <coughs> and I'm the only one who had two undivided years, und undivided attention from them for two years for a whole host of geopolitical and, and craziness that I talk about in the book. That's one example. But secondly, I don't think, when I look at the siblings with whom I share both mom and dad, I genuinely do not think that I am more talented, more gifted than they are. It just ha so happens that the chips fell differently for me. And a lot of them had to sacrifice for me to be where I am today. And again, I also talk about that in the element of love. For the rest, 15 pound. <laughs> yeah. But thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. attempt to follow that, but Hashi, thank you so much for coming. I'm so glad I persevered for more than a year to get you to come here. Um, very thought-provoking talk. Can I also say thank you to all of you for coming, and can I say thank you for your questions, but also thanks for the experiences that you shared. I was expecting a Q&A tonight, 
but actually it's been more like a debate. And it's been yes. really enjoyable, and partly because I've been able to sit down and just enjoy it. Um, I don't know if you know, but Hashi has written a book. <laughs> <laughs> he is available for book signings outside. I suspect we are going to see more of Hashi in the future, so now might be your best chance to, to buy that. And it's discounted for tonight. So thank you very, very much, and we'll see you for future talks. Thank you.